So, welcome class of 2015 to Whistle Blowing 101. I am going to be your lecturer for today. My name is Esther Koch, but that's professor for you, and, or you can call me ma'am, I don't care. I have ex an expectation of you. I have prescribed a 124-page long paper on whistleblowing that I wrote. Has anybody re read it? <laughs> Nobody. <sighs> That's disappointing. Well, good thing I came prepared. And I will be uh, taking you from the beginning then. But enough with the shenanigans. My name is Esther Koch. I'm a lecturer at computing science in, the, uh, in Nijmegen, Han University. And I'm really bad at being uh, sort of a strict teacher because I genuinely like my students. I hope they genuinely like me, um, but that's that. And I am going to teach you something today, I hope, about whistleblowing. Like I said, I'm a lecturer, I teach, but I'm also a self-proclaimed internet hobo which means that I sort of scour the corners of the internet, looking for stuff I like, but I don't really have a home base. My background is in digital security and in data science, and in my spare time, I am, among other things, a cavalrist in the army of Napoleon. I do reenactment, just to clarify that. Um, I will give you some information about your, what you can expect from this talk and what you won't get from this talk. And I will be mostly sort of in this area, because as you saw me, I entered with crutches. I can walk, um, but not that good. So I will be talking to you about ethics, morality. I will be talking to you about legislation, which is European Union, that's a big difference, and uh, Dutch. And I will explain some more about how to apply that to your country. I will be talking to you about disclosure, how to report something you have discovered, if you discovered something that wasn't meant for your eyes. What I will not be talking to you about is how to avoid getting arrested for illegal stuff. <laughs> I am looking at you, script kiddies, because I know you're there, and you're probably <laughs> watching this tape. This is not what you will get from this lecture. Um, also, this lecture will not be about Edward Snowden and the, the, the groundbreaking revelations that he did. This is more sort of day-to-day -day whistleblowing for the average Joe, which in this case is you. Welcome. Um, like I said, we all know about Edward Snowden and his grand adventure with the NSA, um, which was a couple of years back. And more recently, we have uh, had some experience with Ashley Madison, which is quite interesting, um, which was uh, uh, the adventure of Ashley Madden's with the Impact team. I couldn't really find like a good icon for Impact, so I went with like Apocalypse Impact. <laughs> I don't think it's that big of a deal, but yeah, okay. Um, the internet, and it, in extension of that website, are uh, the biggest security headache of our time, and well, before the internet, we had like regular burglars. They could be seen, they could be heard if they were very poor at what they did. If they were more sort of ninja burglars, they were all right. You didn't catch them until they were gone. But these days, we're more worried about hacking and digital break-ins break with hackers that are in mysterious behind the computer. What do they do? Who are they? We don't know. Websites get hacked if we have to believe the news on a daily basis. Databases get accessed. Companies get blackmailed. Governments get exposed. Nothing is really safe or sacred. Like in the case of Ashley Madison, or like the government of the US, maybe. Um, even the things that are like morally wrong isn't safe. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. Like Ashley Madison, or maybe even the US government. I don't know about how morally reprehensible the US government really is, but yeah, Edward Snowden probably has something to say about that. The internet and websites are sort of considered to be gateways into databases in which nefarious types can steal your secrets. And uh, whistleblowing is sort of the aspect that I want to talk to you about today. You, as the web developers, in your day-to-day -day job, have 
a high probability of discovering something that you think, well, this wasn't meant for my eyes. And that chance isn't even remotely small. Um, the discovery I made in my job as a lecturer, I work with all sorts of systems, and one of them is a system for timetables. And I discovered just by clicking around, oh, if I click this, where do I get? If I click that, where do I get? I found out that I can change the timetables of my colleagues, I can change the timetables of not even faculty colleagues, like the entire university, which is kind of a bad thing. So all you have to have to make uh, some sort of discovery is a somewhat inquisitive mind. And as Jessica Rose told us this morning, the mind is something incredible, and uh, I will not be elaborating on that. So the brain. Well, um, you as web developers have quite a good brain, I assume. And like I said, the chance of you stumbling, stumbling upon something that wasn't meant for your eyes is not small. So this talk is for you. Uh, I want to take you back to uh, about half a year ago. Um, I was having my lunch break behind my computer desk, because that's what we do, right? IT people. And my colleague came to me and he said, Esther, Tom and Tijn, two of our second year students, they have discovered something, and we want your opinion. And of course, I got really curious. And curiosity killed the cat, they say, but in this case, I came with anyways. And Tom and Tijn explained to me what they did and what happened. Um, and we start with the game they were playing. They were playing a game that was issued by a large telecom provider in the Netherlands, who shall remain anonymous. <laughs> also, for the sake of this talk, shall be further known as the telecom company that must not be named. And um, what they found, sorry, I'm going to take a drink. The, uh, the, the, the purpose of the game was to find words. Uh, they had to uh, auto-complete, uh, sorry, the, the, the game setup of the game was uh, they had to guess a word which was auto-completed and they had a time pressure, so they had to guess as many words within a given time and they could win some sort of cool electronics, I can't remember. Um, Tom, one of my best students, he noticed something. And he said, well, I believe that the check whether my letter is right or wrong, because the game gave you feedback, is somewhat suspiciously fast. So he suspected there was no check server side. He got on an adventure for, uh, of himself, and he discovered that in the asynchronized XHR request, there was a word. The header used for word was conveniently named word and contained the word, the guess word, in plain text. Well, that made things interesting, so of course the next thing they did, write a script, extract the word from the uh, XHR request, and type it in by hand. And why by hand when you could do it automatically? Well, they didn't want to be suspicious. Because if you get a suspiciously absurd high score, you will be notified. Which, of course, sort of opened the debate between me and my colleague and students. They were kind of cheating the system. But was it illegal what they were doing? So, yeah, was it illegal? And would they want to report it to the right authorities? In this case, the telecom company that must not be named. What do you think? Can I see some hands? Who th here thinks that they should report this sort of cheating, this sort of defect, to the, to the organization? All right, all right. Who here thinks, well, they should have hired maybe more competent developers for this game? <laughs> Thank you. At least you're being honest face to face. Thank you. Okay, 
so this was actually, uh, this reflects perfectly the, 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 the opinion my students um, uh, also had. And we were talking, and so in the end we decided to report the incident to the telecom company who must not be named. And what they got, they emailed them, was the lamest response ever. Something along the lines of, yeah, blah, 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 the game's not that big of a deal, the expiration date is almost here, and after, at the end of the game, we will select the winning contestants from like the top 10 or 20. Oh, and hereby you are excluded from, them from participating in the game, so you can't win. <laughs> Which was really sort of disappointing, right? You hope that you get a really grateful response, but in, yeah, well, no cake at the end. <laughs> in the end, because there, this, uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that this is also not the way to go, thank you PR telecom company who must not be named, we got them cake instead. <laughs> Me and my colleague, because what they did was really good. Which sort of, closes my, my experience and gets me to the next subject, the three Ds of whistleblowing. And these are D batteries, as you might, might know. So that's why there are batteries on the screen. Um, so the three Ds are discovery, debate, and disclosure. And again, this is about everyday whistleblowing. But what is whistleblowing? And I'm gonna quote Wikipedia here. Wikipedia says that whistleblowing, a whistleblower is a person who exposes any kind of informational activity that is deemed illegal, dishonest, or not correct within an organization that is either private or public. So that's a whole mouthful. And I have to say, I love Wikipedia because it's not really fact-based knowledge. If you know sort of how Wikipedia works, you know, it's consensus-based knowledge. So what I think is true from facts, and if I can convince somebody else that this is also true, we get consensus about what the truth is, and that's what Wikipedia is based on. So if I think that the sky is not blue, but a slightly bluish shade of green, and I convince enough of you that this is true, and we edit the Wikipedia page on the sky, the Wikipedia page will say the sky is green which is, of course, rubbish. So that's what Wikipedia says about this. Um, so, uh, so, so enough rumbling about Wikipedia. So Wikipedia says a whistleblower is somebody who exposes stuff. And what kind of stuff is this? This is illegal stuff, which is, could be anything, really. Violation of law, threat to, I'm going to cheat, uh, public interest, yes, fraud, etc., etc. And it also talks about organizations with, which can be either private or public. And a private organization can be like, you know, a company which you might work for. And a public organization is governmental agencies. Um, we also know that whistleblowers are subject of not only public scrutiny, because everybody has an opinion about whistleblowers. You all have an opinion about Edward Snowden or Julian Assange, the impact team. Um, not only is it subject to public scrutiny, but it's also subject to legal repercussions. And I want to talk to you uh, some more about that. Um, but I don't want to go into the groundbreaking governmental secrets, blah, 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 from like Julian Assange or Edward Snowden. I want to keep it to a situation that's applicable to you, the average Joe whistleblower. So you've made a discovery and you think, well, I shouldn't have been able to see that. This is not meant for my eyes, what do I do? So you ask yourself, what sort of situation am I in? And to elaborate on that question, you need to assess a couple of things, like what did I find? How, do I, how, how did I find this? And what is my legal situation? Because that's really important, because there are enough cases that say, well, legal repercussions for everybody. It's like cake. Everybody gets a piece. Have, has anybody of you ever had a course in law? Or hands, I see one hand, thank you, two, three, couple, okay. And has anybody here ever had experience with law? And I don't mean you get a ticket from the police officer down the road, but I mean 
like the penal system. And it sounds really dirty, by the way. A couple, okay, that's really honest, thank you. Well, the rest of you who haven't had that experience, hang on to your helmets, uh, fasten your seat belts, because you are about to get a crash course in the legal system of the European Union and the Netherlands. And I'm gonna disclaim this, everything I say is applicable to the European Union and the Netherlands. We are here with 35 different nationalities, so it might not be applicable to your situation. Uh, if you are a citizen of the European Union, but not Dutch, which is uh, sort of, we can assume, the majority of my talk can still apply to your situation. I'm just going to go into some one, one piece of Dutch legislation that's also applicable to this. So, the introduction into law. Uh, I think I... Yeah, sorry, I skipped it. The introduction into law. How does the Dutch and the European Union system work? Well, it's basically a top-down system. So at the bottom, you find the most basic and important piece of legislation, and everything that's above it is based on that majorly uh, important piece. And I'm really sorry if it can get a bit technical, but yeah, the law is kind of boring, but I do think it's really important that you know this. Um, so at the bottom, we find in the European Union the fundamental, char fundamental charter of human rights of the European Union which sort of describes our rights as citizens of the EU. And to make things more confusing, we are also citizens of Europe, which, is, has, which has its own charter, which is slightly different than the European Union charter. Just to make things easy. Okay, so we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and on top of that, the European legislation is created. And uh, the EU has a commission that sort of dictates in different types of legislation what the law is in the European Union, of which, for whistleblowing, the most important piece of, uh, pieces of legislation are the Data Protection Directive, the Data Retention Directive, and the E-Commerce Directive. And directives are bases on which national law can be built. So they kind of say, okay, if you want to make national law, you have to implement this which is kind of dull. In this talk, I will be mostly speaking about the Data Protection Directive, simply because I do not have enough time to elaborate on the Retention Directive and the E-Commerce Directive, and, um, but I do think that these are really important pieces of legislation, and uh, I will publish my lecture notes after uh, this, and also my, uh, my lecture slides, so you can look into things if you find this interesting. Um, what we find at the top of the pyramid is, in my case, Dutch legislation, but in European Union legislation, like any kind of national legislation. And uh, one of, when we talk about whistleblowing, the most important piece of legislation on national level is the penal code, which is a description of what is legal or illegal in the Netherlands, or in your country, maybe. I do know about the US that... Um, their legislation on uh, personal data and protection of privacy is somewhat less strict than the European Union legislation. So if you're from the US, bear with me, it might not even apply to you. Okay, back to our discovery. We're going to ask ourselves, what did we find? And we're going to assess this. The most important pieces of legislation to keep in mind are uh, to start with the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And it has two articles. I'm not going to quote them because, to be honest, they're quite dull. I don't like, like these long descriptions. So I'm just going to say what, what they're about. We have Article 7, which is about the respect for privacy and life. And we have Article 8, which is about the protection of personal data. And they just say, like, you have, as a citizen of the European right to, to protection of your personal life and your personal data. But what is personal data? And I think this is a really important question. What is personal data? The Data Protection Directive is really clear about this. And because I find this such an important question, I am going to quote this one. Any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person is personal data. In other words, 
anything that can lead to your identification. And if you've ever had experience with Google, you know you are getting digitally, digitally profiled. Anything can lead to your identity. I'm going to make an example. Let's say that the Laracon organization has created a database. And in this database are all of you. And we're not going to include your social security number or your name. That will be too easy. In this database, we have your gender. And well, let's take out one person. We have a female, which is kind of a majority here. So that makes it easier for us. And if we know this female is blonde, we have an even more distinguished set of attributes. And if we somehow find that the Laracon organization has decided to keep track of what we are wearing, because, I don't know, they want to call the fashion police or something. <laughs> they kept track of what we are wearing, and we know that this person is wearing a dress, so she's blonde and wearing a dress. Well, that makes it easy, right? There are probably one or two of these walking around, and one of them gave a lecture this morning, uh, a talk this morning. So. Easy peasy, we know who we have. So this seemingly unimportant set of attributes, what you're wearing, what your hair color is, and what your gender is, combined can make personal data. And that is something quite important. So let's say we have discovered the Laracon organization's database. And we found that this contains personal data. The next step that we want to... Um, think about is how did we find it? And there is really no guide I can give you on uh, how to describe this, but the, the most basic thing you can do is go back, retrace your steps, what did I do to get here? And write it down. You really want to write this down. So retrace your steps, write it down. But be careful, you found personal data. Legislation is really strict about this. You cannot touch personal data that does not belong to you. Unless, well, let's not go into that because I'll be talking for another hour here. So we found personal data. We're, we're tracing our steps, but we do not want to touch our personal data. And in the case of Ashley Madison, we've seen how disastrous that can be when you do touch it. When you download the database, don't do that. Don't be the impact team. Please don't be. People have committed suicide, it's awful. So, we're gonna assess our legal situation. We've retraced our steps, we didn't touch the database, we just found, hey, I can access this database, this is really bad. What kind of legal situation am I in? Well, you think, I've just stumbled upon this, right? I didn't go looking for it, I didn't um, uh, try to hack into the database, I didn't try to brute force a password, I just stumbled upon it. I didn't do anything illegal, right? Well, wrong. According to the Dutch law under Article 138b, which is known as computer trespassing law, you are punishable. And I will quote this law because, I th to be honest, I think this is a ridiculous law. It is punishable by prison or fine to be found guilty of computer trespassing which is defined as he who enters an automated work, automated work or part thereof by using technical means. That means that if you go browsing in someone's computer that isn't secured without consent of the comp uh, computer's owner, you are punishable by law, either by prison or fine. And this is also acknowledged by our own government, uh, we have in the, ne uh, in the Netherlands, we have the, the um, National Cybersecurity Organization Center, uh, which is a really cool center, by the way, a really cool organization. I love them. And they say that it is indeed punishable by law. And I'm going to quote them again, because I'm such a big fan of them. They say in a document about responsible disclosure, which comes after this part, that reporting the vulnerability does not safeguard the reporter from cri criminal investigation and persecution. So keep in mind that if you do decide to report whatever it is you found, you are punishable by law. 
Um, and it also states that if you and the, orga uh, the organization can make uh, an agreement on not to persecute law, it can also be agreed that no civil action will be taken against you. Um, please do note that I cannot give like the complete overview of every possible situation in the context of this talk, but if you want to discuss this later, I am available during the break, I'm available at the end of the conference, come to me, because I'd like to discuss this. So, we've made a discovery. And we've mapped our legal situation, which is almost any time punishable by Dutch law. So we're going to debate, do we really want to report this? Because we've seen Edward Snowden, and we've seen Assange, and of course these were major governmental secrets. But yeah, you could have bad luck and have a, uh, a private company sue you. So we're going to debate whether we want to report this. And um, we're going to do some internal debate. We want to know what are the legal reper uh, repercussions. We've just mapped those so we know we are probably punishable by law. And we're going to use some ethical theories. And I see I'm kind of short on time. So I'm not going to go in there like majorly. If you want to know more, please see my lecture notes. Um, but ethical consciousness is a development stemming, and I'm going to quote again, because I'm, uh, I, uh, I used a paper from Maggie Johnson. If you want to read more of her stuff, it's amazing. Um, Ethics is a, de a development stemming from man's reflection on the intention and consequences of his acts. So basically, there are several ways to look at conscience, and it stems from our inner reflection on acts. And we have a, a number of theories you can apply to this. Uh, and one of the theories is the intu intu in sorry, I can't pronounce this. The intuitionists that say one knows immediately from within how to act morally, to know right from wrong. And we have the other side, and which is also kind of a big word, and I can't really pronounce it, the empiricists, hey, there we go, they deny this. And they say, no, it's not about inside, it's about gathering experience and getting more to know about our consensus in our community, on which you can base your moral acts. Well, we can apply some different ethical theories. I'm going to skip those because, honestly, we're kind of short on time. I'm uh, already on 45 minutes. Um, but do read my lecture notes if you want. So we've established that we're going to... Uh, we, we based our um, moral decision on our ethical theories. Oh, I have, I have 25 minutes left. Oh, then the clock on my laptop is incorrect. Wow. Okay, so we have time. Who here would like to know some more about ethical theories? <laughs> Basically, we have three theories. You tell your... Me in big words, right? You tell your... It's like I'm trying to pronounce aluminum. In, in Dutch, it's aluminium, and it's like aluminium. You tell Leah Riddletism. <laughs> please read my lecture notes. <laughs> Which is the, <laughs> the evaluation of one's actions based on the goal or consequences. So basically, you try to get the biggest net benefit for everybody and base your decision on that. One other thing I can pronounce this is pluralism which is the evaluation of actions regardless of consequences and based on um, duty. Yes, it's duty-based. So what is my moral obligation? What is my duty in this case? And we also have another big word. This, uh, eth ethical theorists like their big words. Contractarianism, hey. Which is also the evaluation of actions regardless of consequence, but now it's based on human rights. So. We have three theories we can apply to our situation, and I'm just going to, uh, because of the time, I'm going to use uh, Ashley Madison as a case study for this, because honestly, Ashley Madison is the case study on ethics right now. 
because what they did was morally reprehensible. But then again, you can debate whether the website itself was morally reprehensible. To grab back to the case of Ashley Madison, we can debate based on utilitarianism. <laughs> How much does the right of the subjects that are affected in this case outweigh the rights of the subjects' spouses, their families? So in other words, what do we gain by this action in words of... Um, sorry, I'm kind of lost. What do we gain? How much net benefit does it have to expose these people to their families who now know that their spouses have cheated on them, had an affair? Um, and you try to make sort of moral calculus, which is, in my eyes, kind of ridiculous, because how can you outweigh the right of the one to the right of the many? Which is also interesting moral discussion. When we talk about plural, pluralism, hey, I used to be able to pronounce that quite well. What happened? When we talk about pluralism, in the case of Ashley Madison, we say, okay, what's the duty here? Apparently, the impact team felt it's their duty as computer hackers, as technological savvy people, to expose these criminals to morality. And that's probably what you can find in their duty. The problem with this theory is that duty is not universal law. So my feeling of duty can be something completely different than your feeling of duty. When we talk about contract tyrannism, okay, <laughs> um, the right one, the right action is usually the one that doesn't violate anybody's legal or human rights. In the case of Ashley Madison, it violates everybody's rights. So, what were they thinking, right? On the one hand, you have the right to privacy of the data subjects that got exposed, who are now under public scrutiny. On the other hand, you have the right of their families to know everything their spouses are doing wrong, right? I mean, is that something I'm, I'm just making up here? Who here feels like they have the right to have honest treatment from their spouse. Yeah, right? I mean, that's not so dumb to say. Okay, so we have these three theories. We can apply them all to, to Ashley Madison, but we're going to apply them to our own case, and we're going to really start this internal debate. I'm not going to um, uh, hold your hands here, but we've decided, okay, there are legal consequences to what we're going to do if we expose this, there are moral obligations that we have. We are going to analyze uh, our decision. So you can apply these theories to your decision. And I cannot actually... Hey, why is it double? Here we go. I cannot actually hold your hands in this situation. You really have to decide what outweighs one another. So pros and cons. If I tell this to the company that I, whose, uh, whose weakness I discovered, if I tell to the Laracon organization that I discovered their database, I might get incarcerated for that or fined. I don't know if Laracon is really um, that mean. But hey, who knows? So on the one hand, you have the legal repercussions. On the other hand, you might feel morally obligated to report this because you don't want other people uh, to have their privacy violated and it might, might be your own because we're all here, right? Okay, this is not something I can decide for you. You are the only one who can decide this for yourself. Now, once we've decided that we're going to report this to the Laracon organization, we're going to disclose it. And that raises the question, how do I report my findings? In the scope of this talk, we are going to talk about responsible and full disclosure, which are two basically different things, but they're kind of the same. The definition of responsible disclosure is, and I quote, 
as provided by the, Europe, uh, by the Dutch government, that you do not report your findings to anybody else before you report it to the involved party it, it itself, and that you do not exploit the discovery you have made. In other words, we can conclude that the Ashley Madison was not, in fact, responsible disclosure, right? Because they just threw it on the internet, say, we have 30 gigs of data, yeah. <laughs> and this 30 gigs of data, we're going to expose to everybody, and you're going to cry in a corner. So that's not really responsible. And people died. I mean, that's awful. And I do not condone this sort of action. On the other hand, we have full disclosure, which differs from responsible disclosure. And um, full disclosure is all about publishing what you found in its completeness. Of course, when you do responsible disclosure, you also want to uh, um, like define the technical uh, properties you found, what you found, where you found it, etc. Full disclosure, you do this without uh, informing the involved party. And uh, I'm going to quote Bruce Snyder, which is an American, well-known uh, American cryptographer, who has some inter interesting things to say about this. He says that full disclosure, so the practice of making the details of security vulnerabilities public, is a damn good idea. Public scrutiny is the only reliable way to improve security, while well, secrecy only makes us less secure. If researchers don't go public, things won't get fixed. Companies don't see it as a security problem, they see it as a PR problem. Which is true, but they're not, not mutually exclusive. You can mix and match. You can say, okay, company X, Laracon organization, I have discovered your database, and I want to disclose this to you, but I also want to write a research paper on it. Well, hopefully, the Laracon organization will tell you, ah, that's great, we love research papers. I don't know if you do, but hey, we love research papers, right? Okay, and while I am with Bruce Schneier on this, that full disclosure is the only way, as a community, that we're gonna get further, so we can experience the mistakes other people made, and uh, expand on that, I do not think that uh, in, in most cases full disclosure is the only way to go. So I'm all in favor of mix and, mixing and matching this. Uh, especially if you consider that uh, if you do a full disclosure without involving the involved party, you might have a lawsuit on your pants. Is that... Um, that's really a, 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 a Dutchification, <laughs> or an Englishification of a Dutch verb. Sorry about that. But if entire populations depend on your system, you don't want the system on the streets. And uh, one of the most well-known uh, security uh, incidents of hacking the, um, in, in uh, the history of the Netherlands is actually the security hack of DigiNotar. Oh, it goes up. Anybody here ever heard of DigiNotar? Okay, I see a couple of hands. Does this mean, and I want to see your hands, that the rest of you haven't heard of DigiNotar? Okay, okay, so I will elaborate on that. DigiNotar is, uh, was, <laughs> I have to say, because they're now fin financially bankrupt, a company in the Netherlands that uh, gave out security certificate for certificates for your browser. And as web developer, I'm sure some of you, most of you maybe even, have had the experience of certification for your website. What happened is that in 2011, it was discovered that the security certificate issued by DigiNota on the iranian.google.com domain was not legitimate. And it was discovered by uh, Google Chrome, which has this sort of internal application that doesn't check the certificate's path, but checks with Google itself whether the uh, certificate is legit. And it discovered it wasn't. So what happened after, well, I think it was a couple of months, DigiNoto in the end was declared bankrupt because they had a security breach and uh, Iranian hackers were, be, uh, were able to infiltrate the system and issue a uh, illegal certificate on the Iranian Google domain. What they did absolutely wrong is they didn't disclose this, DigiNotar didn't disclose this in the beginning 
to the Dutch government, which was their client. And the Dutch government relied on the security of their certificates. So they found internally that it was something wrong. They found a hack and they kept it a secret, which is not responsible disclosure. And in the end, uh, the government lost uh, their, their confidence in Diginotar and Diginotar was uh, proclaimed uh, bankrupt. Of course, this is uh, the, um, uh, an example of how not to do responsible disclosure and how you do not want to keep your secrets inside your company if you have clients relying on your product, especially if it's something security-based. And the legal repercussions are based on whether you choose to make responsible disclosure or not. As in the case of Diginota, they went bankrupt because of a loss of confidence. And they might have not lost the confidence of the government if they had told them as soon as they discovered it, hey, there's something wrong. Something is wrong with this certificate. What happened? We want support, we want to go uh, into an internal investigation, what's wrong with our system? And that raises the next question, how do I disclosure? So to keep it in the, the English, I love English. How do I disclosure? Or perhaps a better question is, what do we disclose and who do we disclose it to? And um, if you follow the previous steps, You've already made quite a detailed report on what you have found and where you have found it. So, hey, ta-da, that's what we disclose, of course. We want to disclose as many detailed information as we can. But who do we disclose it to? And the Dutch government, who is your friend, have given us some clear guidelines on that, which is really helpful on how to approach disclosure. And they've even ha ha they even have a specified email address for this, so you can report anything you find in the uh, Dutch governmental agencies to them. Helpful. Government is your friend. They say on the website, they give the following directions. Give the amount of information needed to reproduce the problem. Check. We did that. Give something on which you can be contacted, like an email address or telephone number. Okay, we have that. Make your disclosure as fast as possible after you have made your discovery. Okay, we've done that too. Do not share the details of your discovery with anybody until the problem has been resolved. And that's really important, and that's why I said in my uh, in previous talk about retracing your steps, <laughs> do not touch anything you, do, uh, uh, you don't need to touch, do not download anything, and do not talk to anybody. And that brings us to the last point the Dutch government says. Do not do anything else than what is strictly necessary to point out the security problem. And this is based in um, the, legality of the, system, uh, uh, the legality of the situation. You do not want to disclose anything to anybody until the problem has been uh, resolved, unless you want to do full disclosure without consulting the involved party. And if you follow these steps, which are really helpful, and uh, I might sound sarcastic, but I'm actually really a big fan of these steps, the government gives you icing on your cake. They say, well, if you follow these steps, tick all the boxes, do a responsible disclosure, we will not sue you. <laughs> the government is your friend. I like it when the government says, we won't sue you. Which brings us to the closing of the three Ds of whistleblowing. And these are D chords. So that's why there are three of them. The three Ds of whistleblowing were, please repeat with me. Can you repeat with me? Discovery. Discovery. Yay, debate. debate. Yes. Disclosure, thank you. Right, okay. Um, before I end my talk with a short summary of, uh, of what we, uh, uh, the sort of research questions that we've, no, they're not really research questions, but the disclosure questions that we try to answer, I would like your attention for one bit. This presentation was made with help of the Noun Project. Who here knows about the Noun Project? Ah, oh, great. Go give them some love. I will... Um, include the website in my talk notes, because 
they have icons for practically any verb you can think of, or any noun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they have words for practically any noun you can think of. They even have uh, words for verbs. And um, to summarize, the, the questions that we tried to answer in this talk were, what sort of situation am I in? What did I found, find? How did I find it? What is the legal situation I'm in? Do I want to report this? What could, be, what could possible legal repercussions be? What kind of ethics can I apply to my situation? What kind of moral obligations do I have? How do I report my findings and to whom? And I want to thank you all. You guys rock. <laughs> yeah. You can find me on Twitter. I, I want to warn you, this is my personal Twitter on which I spew geek stuff. Um, like I said, I'm sort of an internet hobo, so anything I find interesting and want to share with the world, I just spew on there, so it might not be relevant for your, uh, to your interests. Um, and please grade me. This was the first talk I gave ever at a congress. I know I'm a lecturer and I'm used to like a tenth percentage, no, not a tenth percent, ten percent of the room I'm currently talking in, and also there's a really b uh, big difference in uh, context. But um, if you want to ask me questions, there is time now. Um, but if you want to discuss something that's sort of you don't want to mention here in the room, uh, like I said, I'm available during the breaks after the Congress. Please come look me up. Um, thank you for your attention. I see a question. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, a couple of months ago, I discovered a loophole in uh, the paywall of the biggest uh, uh, newspaper in the Netherlands. Shall be renamed on. Uh, it starts with a T as well. Oh. <laughs> um, I just discovered it. Um, you can read all their premier articles for free. I can show it you on your browser within one minute. Um, but I tried to contact them. Yes. The, the newspaper with a T. Um, but they completely ignored me. I sent them emails, Twitter, LinkedIn, the works. But obviously, they're not into this stuff. So what is your take on this? I already published it on a small blog, uh, personal blog, but it's not fixed. So what's your take on that? Is there any legal issues here that I should be afraid of? Uh, no. In, in first, I don't think you have a lot to worry about. Um, you have taken the appropriate steps to uh, um, so I'm looking for the word, to approach um, the newspaper who not, must not be named. Um, it's not the trouw. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's, it's the SBSS newspaper, I guess. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Sorry, to come back to your question. Uh, so, in, in, in essence, I don't think you have a lot to worry about, legally speaking, uh, because you took the appropriate steps to uh, approach them on you found something. Um, there might be an issue on who you approached, like you did Twitter, you did email. Those are all First, I, I, uh, the technical director, the... You you yeah, yeah, the, the CTO. No, no, not the CTO, but IT managers. I try to uh, communicate with the head of communications. I even mailed their, their new staff and, well, it's probably me, but they're not interested in it. But it's okay. a nice bug because I use it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to keep that on a closed lid. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but um, have you tried contacting the web developers? Uh, yeah, a couple of them. A couple of them, and they didn't give you any response? No, and it appears that a couple of years ago, somebody else 
discovered a similar bug and they they closed that loophole, but they didn't close this one, which is kind of similar. It's a feature. Yeah, yeah. it's not a bug, it's a feature. What? Oh, then I can tell you all. It's like... What a bunch of lamos! Yeah, I mean, I you found you something you're willing to share, and then... You can, you, you can read a blog about it. I will... Yeah. It's progblog.nl. Maybe I should buy you a cake then. <laughs> we all love cake, right? No, but maybe we can discuss this uh, the, after the talk. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh, I see one over there. Okay, uh, we have just time for this one last one. Okay. Okay, so you mentioned uh, personal data as any information that can lead back to you. Yeah. Um, but your uh, your example leads to two pers uh, two people. Oh, where <laughs> it does. Oh, wasn't that what you meant? But I was asking where is the the, bo um, yeah, the border? If you like your zip code, if you live alone, well, it's clearly you. But if you live in I don't know a student dorm, it could be tens of people. Where is the border that makes it personal? That, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure, I'm going to be honest. Um, what I do know is that zip code is one of the major pieces of personal data that you can have, like your address, your social security number. Uh, it doesn't have to have your name on it to be able to retrace it to you. Um, and attributes like hair color or gender or um, how tall you are, those are seemingly unimportant attributes, but combined can also be personal data. So your address is personal data in itself. So we know you live on this address. And uh, it could be the address where you and, I know, your family members, um, they all live. It could be like five or ten family mem members. But in the end, it's always retraceable to you because they ha only have to combine that address with one other piece of information to be able to pinpoint one person. Yeah. Okay, thank you.